Hello, my name's Jonathan James, and I'm about to take you through 1,500 years or thereabouts of the history of Western art music. So I hope, like me, you've got a nice hot cup of tea because um, it's quite a ride. I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. And let's just get a disclaimer in there early. I'm going to cheat a bit. I'm going to miss out vast swathes of history, as is the nature of an overview of this kind. Instead, we're going to look at the evolution of the musical language itself. So how we get from a small stream of notes to something like to and into the Baroque era already. That trill is very important. Classical era, notice I'm sitting upright. Romantic. Impressionist. Modern. Something like that. So, where are we going to start? Well, let me take you to the world of a church in, say, Antioch or Ephesus, somewhere deep in the Byzantine Empire. And there you will have heard monks chanting the scriptures a little like this. Imagine a big beard, right? Halfway between chanting and reading. Nice vibrato. Doxa, did you hear that word? It's uh, a hymn of praise. Beautiful! Isn't it? So spacious. And can you imagine that just echoing around? And we started in the church because it's thanks to monks like those that we have a traceable history of music. The minstrels and troubadours and the folk musicians unfortunately didn't write their music down initially. So it's easier to trace the language of music as the monks began to puzzle out how to write rhythms and pitch and it's thanks to them that we now have a history that we can trace right the way through to symphonies and concertos and the sonatas of today. So we start with freedom. Let's just go back to those three notes. Now, in fact, let me take another monk, Frere Jacques. You know that one, right? <laughs> if I were to sing Frere Jacques in a medieval style, or even an ancient style, I wouldn't get much beyond frere. <laughs> it would sound like frere. I could go on for another four minutes if I wanted to. In fact, I did. Just on that one vowel, spreading it like honey over as many bars as possible, except they didn't have bars, but you know, stretching it out over time and giving a sense of freedom and of eternity. And then, if you couldn't sing so well, maybe you just sort of hold a drone and go, oh, like that, and over the top, you'd have the free drone. And then if there were short responses or phrases and you wanted to join in, you maybe would go in the same direction according to your voice weight or type. So you might be up there or down there or down there, depending on how large you are. And that's called parallel movement in organum because it organically suits the weight of the voice. And then when we get to the Renaissance period, well, things are beginning to get freer already and the lines are beginning to swirl around in direct, different directions. Um, but there is some order here. So you would imitate what the other voice is doing, at least as a starting point. So if we were going to do Frere Jacques again, right? Somebody might go Frere Jacques and then another... Like that. Let me give you a better example of Renaissance music making and where better to go than the master himself, Palestrina. Here is 
a mass that he wrote, one of the many, the Agnus Dei from the Missa Papa Marcelli. Again, imagine this in the Sistine Chapel, close your eyes. It's like incense, isn't it? Subtle imitation going on there. Now, where would you press pause here? Like me, it's, it's difficult. I'm just going to go for it now. The thing is, it doesn't have natural semicolons or full stops, natural cadences. It's designed just to flow as if endlessly, as if imitating eternity. And there's a, also a sort of an architectural idea here in which the music is imitating. Imagine fan vaulting going pillar by pillar by pillar right the way down the nave being echoed. And the music is imitating that design as well. And if you think of Renaissance paintings, what's new about them? Well, they have perspective. And how, how do you do that in music and sound? You introduce that idea of echoes and imitation. It's the most perfect music to relax to and to just unwind after a stressful day. I commend it to you. Renaissance choral singing, absolutely wonderfully relaxing. Now you might ask, so where are the instruments at this stage? Unfortunately, they're outside of the church doors because the church fathers disallowed them. Here's a quote from one such church father about the use of instruments. And he says, they raise a great din. He's not wrong there, actually. Um, early medieval instruments are quite harsh to the ear. They raise a great din and under the influence of which a multitude of other lascivious souls abandon themselves to bizarre movements of the body. So he's meaning dancing, right? <laughs> no dancing in the church, please, basically. And, and instruments seemed to invite that in a way that sacred singing did not. And sacred singing was all about the text, of course, and illuminating the Bible. And yet, by the time we get to 1610, and Monteverdi's Vespers of the Blessed Virgin Mary, instruments have crept in. We've got an organ, we've got sackbuts and cornets, so wonderful brass instruments, and stringed instruments also. So that means that, say you were in the St Mark's Basilica around 1610, you might, had you been lucky, heard something like this. of sound, fireworks, right? Strong pulse. Now listen out for this. Oh, I'm dancing, look. Oh my goodness me. What a glorious fusion of different styles going on there between the world of dance, the secular world really coming in with the sacred. And if you listen to the Vespers, which I really encourage you to do from beginning to end, you'll have a wonderful crucible of different thoughts and ideas taken from the musical world, whether it's airs and madrigals or chants and mass-like material, mass as in sacred material. So it's all coming together in this funky fusion, thanks to Monteverdi. And he brought in what was called the Secunda Practica. And we're now, ladies and gentlemen, in the Baroque era. It's an era of celebrity, almost of cult celebrity status. If you think of the uh, castrato singers Farinelli or the violinist Paganini, put up on a pedestal and championed really for their virtuosity not only as players, but also as improvisers. And if you were to look at a typical piece of Baroque music, 
it wouldn't always be written out in full. You just have just the shape of the music and it would be down to the performer to interpret that and add their own ornaments. Let's look at the keyboard style of Couperin as an example for you, which is rather grand. And I'm going to select a harpsichord sound now, just to put us in the period. We need something stately because we're now outside of the church and perhaps in a banquet hall. Something like... Are you recognising Frere Jacquer in there? I hope so. So a grand opening after which you'd naturally have something more chirpy and voices chasing each other around the table legs. I'm trying to be as frilly as possible and those ornaments that or very important part of the Baroque language. And Couperin said that if you ignored them, including the, the, the detail, the difference between, say, and that would be an, an unpardonable negligence. That's what he wrote. So in the Baroque period, we have composers testing the limits of the instrument, seeing what the new design of violins could really do if you play not just one string but all four for example at the same time and doing the same really across the board of instruments that are being made uh, at this wonderfully rich time for instrument uh, instrument makers and also testing the capacity of the soloist not just as an improviser but in terms of their technical brilliance as well and Bach, if we now skip to the late Baroque, so we're going now to about, you know, the 1720s and beyond into this, the high Baroque, also looked at how to fuse together, not unlike Monteverdi, all the new innovations of music making that were coming from France, Italy, a bit of Spain, certainly Germany, where he was based, and England. Yes, even a little bit of the English madrigal comes in here into the Bach style. But I suppose what he's most famous for is his contrapuntal writing. Punctus contra punctus, one note set against another. He was a complete genius, a chess master of counterpoint, bringing these lines together, not just in a correct way, but in such an imaginative and engaging way as well. And one example of counterpoint was the prelude and fugue, particularly the fugue part. Let me try for you a prelude and fugue um, based on Frere Jacques. Okay, and again, I'm going to choose now uh, an organ sound, something a little bit like that. So a prelude would explore a key centre like this. That's D minor. And we would take it for a walk. to Picardy, um, a Picardy third. We've gone as a major, hurrah, thanks to some jolly monks in the region of Picardy in France who decided they didn't always go want to go back to the minor again. So that's the prelude. We now get a sense, you know, of what D minor can do. And after that, we get something really quite strict in that we start with a fugal subject, it's called. Answer. No tears to Piketty 
there, I'm afraid. So there you go. That is an example of how lines can be rigidly brought together into the form of a fugue. And Bach was the master at making it thrilling and making it sound free, even though there is that underlying architecture. So let's go back to a piano sound now. And sadly, I don't have a forte piano sound because that's the earlier form of piano in the classical period. But that is an Alberti bass, and that immediately tells our ear that we're in the classical period. So we've reached now 1750. And this, I suppose, is the first of two major reboots in the history of Western art music. The second will come in the 20th century, when music will be questioned in new ways and rebooted uh, from the ground up. In the classical period, what they were concerned with was clarity and equipoise and balance. So they wanted to get rid of the fusty, over complex lines of a fugue, for example, and instead have a clear melodic line and underneath a gentle accompaniment that doesn't get in the way. So Frere Jacques sounds quite good, I think, in a classical style. Let me just attempt that for you now. Here we go. modulated everybody. I've gone into a new key. Isn't that exciting? They were good at that in the classical period. Elegant and built on simple two or four bar phrases so it feels good on the inside to listen to classical music you probably have heard of the mozart effect where just by listening to this very symmetrical phrasing you're lulled into a, a, a really sort of well-ordered space subliminally almost just to make that point if you think of mozart's if you can sort of recollect mozart's uh, 40th symphony. Two four-bar phrases. And we kind of know that, even without counting them, right? Just feels right. If I were to add a bar here and make them five-bar phrases, it should make you feel a little bit uneasy. Uh, let's start. winged butterfly. Something slightly grotesque about that, isn't there? So in the classical period, there are three main names that we think of. Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven. And the stereotypical way of presenting these three composers is to say, well, Haydn consolidated the forms of the string quartets, the symphony and uh, the concerto even to a certain extent. And then Mozart perfected them. And then along came Beethoven and he broke all the rules. Well, that's only true to a certain extent. In fact, they all broke rules and they all were perfect in the way they treated the language. But if we look at a Haydn symphony, it's true to say that he set up the form in the way that was going to stay until really the early 1900s. So we have four movements. The first movement is a debate, um, something really quite rational, quite dramatic as well. The second movement is more like a Baroque aria, uh, a lament or say a love song. The third movement, well, this is new and he's borrowed this from the world of rustic dance, is a minuet and trio. Beethoven was going to prefer a scherzo, but Haydn loved a good rustic dance for his third movement, for example, from his 94th symphony. I feel like slapping my thighs there, you know? Where's my Lederhosen gone? I don't know. Didn't always have to be that 
party, you know, it could be dainty, but essentially it was a rustic dance. And then for the fourth movement, there would be an exhilarating finale, something really quite exuberant and show-offy. So that was certainly a form, a symphonic form, perfected uh, by Haydn and taken into new dramatic areas by Mozart, who brought in the world of the opera, the darkness and light of the theatre stage, into his symphonic writing as well. And if you want a way into Mozart's symphony, start really from symphony th number 35, the Hafner, right the way through to the great Jupiter, number 41. And those six symphonies are masterpieces of their kind. Beethoven. <laughs> blow things out the water with his symphonies in particular. You know, that was the beginning of the Eroica Symphony, number three out of nine that Beethoven wrote. And there, those two chords, boom, boom, cannon shots, are the introduction. And then we get straight on with the theme. So he was going to do all sorts of wonderful things with form. And there is something, I don't know, almost brutish about Beethoven's use of an obsessively repeated rhythm. It can feel like body blows, and particularly in the Eroica Symphony. Listen to the first movement of the Eroica, and it's pugnacious, and the accents just proliferate, you know, one piling on top of the other. And Beethoven was to have a new emotional directness to his writing as well. Mozart, I don't think, would have written something like this. Can you feel this turbulence surging? It's so exciting, isn't it? That was the Appassionata Sonata by Beethoven, very appropriately named. When Beethoven died in 1827, we're actually now at the start of a really exciting new era, the Romantic era, and it's going to be so varied and diverse. Let me just give you an example of that. Here is the opening movement to Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony, written in 1833. Bracing, isn't it? Italian sunshine. Did you hear how we had a nice classical melody, neatly ordered over an accompaniment? The roles of the orchestra very cleanly divided there. So classical principles still at play here in the work of Mendelssohn. And then let's just jump 55 years ahead to 1888. And now we have the second symphony of Mahler, the Resurrection Symphony. And if you're wondering, what does resurrection sound like in music? Well, something a bit like this. Fanfares of fiery angels and the heavens being torn apart in this very romantic vision there by Mahler. So that's using an orchestra of over 100 players and it's a symphony that goes well beyond the hour mark. Where, whereas with Mendelssohn it's about 50 players and it's over within half an hour. So vastly different resources that are being used here and therefore a huge variety of colour being exploited and explored by the late Romantics compared to those just a generation earlier. But there are some threads here that hold this variety together. One of them is transcendence, how to go beyond what you thought was expected, both of the instrument and of the performer. Let's hear how Chopin does that with this etude, this study in C major. So where Beethoven would say, do that, Chopin would say, why, why stop there? Why not go up to there or even, you know, five octaves? Here we go. Here's Maurizio Paolini showing how it's done.
Isn't that splendid? <laughs> I think that's one of the most glorious explorations of C major in the keyboard literature. So what would Frere Jacques sound like in a romantic style? Well, let me show you. A new, bright new key. Some conflict. But we've got a triumph over the conflict. overlong bombastic ending. That's a stereotypical romantic keyboard piece, isn't it? I hope that gives you a sense of the style anyway. So not only was it about the transcendence of the instruments and where you could really go and I guess show off with what you were composing and playing, but also it was about telling a story in a far more detailed way than before. In fact, you'd have to go right the way back to Vivaldi and the early Baroque masters to have storytelling in quite the same colour and vivid detail. There was, however, a split here between two very different visions for music, two very different aesthetics, and we talk about the war of the Romantics. So on the one hand, you have composers such as Berlioz, Liszt, and eventually Wagner, who want their music to tell a story, and very obviously so. They are programmatic composers. And on the other side, you have uh, Schumann, Mendelssohn before him, through to Brahms and beyond. And they are allowing the music itself to tell the story. They are so-called abstract composers. So you have the abstract against the programmatic camps. Let me just give you an example of that. Here is Brahms's first symphony, marvellous work, very, very dramatic, but it's up to you to create the story around this opening. You, you saw me hovering over the pause button there, didn't you? And I didn't want to stop that phrase because part of the point of Brahms and part of the joy of listening to Brahms is that you're drawn along these wonderfully long phrases and uh, he knows how to sustain them so beautifully with the harmony and drama beneath. So what was that about? It's up to you and that's the point. Whereas if we go to, say, a typical tone poem, uh, a piece of music that deliberately describes a story, then obviously it's going to be different. So here, let's go to the fantasy overture inspired by Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet by Tchaikovsky. Brahms and Tchaikovsky, no great friends, it has to be said, although there was a mutual respect there, begrudged, I feel. Let me just go, I don't know, eight minutes into this overture and you get this. That moment where the young lovers throw each other, or throw themselves into each other's arms, rather. It'd be more fun if they did throw each other. It's emotions being worn on the sleeve, isn't it? Heart and sleeve. I'm trying not to swoon here. Notice again the length of line. They're really spreading it out, aren't they, these romantic composers? And a really satisfying peak to that phrase as well. He's great at building tension, Tchaikovsky, isn't he? 
and the panting horn there in the background. Very, very suggestive. Let's get to the end of this. In comes the angelic harp there. So very different styles. And that's part of the joy of listening to the Romantic period, you know, it depends on your mood. You can choose something bracing like Mendelssohn or indulge in a bit of Tchaikovsky. Where would we go from there? I mean, if you think of Wagner's Ring Cycle, that's four operas lasting about 17 hours, really testing your stamina as a listener. What happens after that? It's already gargantuan. Well, we are now in the 20th century and there are going to be various key influences here that will help explode the parameters of music as we know them. One of them is to look not to Western Europe for your main influence, but to the Orient and to something a whole lot more exotic. So if you think of Ravel and of Debussy, they're bringing in the sound of Indonesian gamelan and just of, I don't know, just something so much more colourful and unimaginable to even the composers of 50 years before. Let me try Farah Jacka, because I know you can't wait to hear this, in an Impressionist style. I'm just dreaming. A Spanish guitar riff here, perhaps? sense of freedom, some jazz infused chords, but did you enjoy those harmonies there? There is more freedom, isn't there? And it's more sensual, I hope. Debussy said, pleasure is the law. So instead of doing something rather classical like that, if I want to do this chord, because it feels good under the fingers, and then something effervescent and bright, then I can. Equally with rhythm, instead of going one, two, three, four, all the way through, I could, as Stravinsky did, do something like... You know, where was the one in that? You don't know. And that's the point. He could be using 11-4 or 3-8 or 5-8. Doesn't matter. He's just setting rhythm free. And it's really, really exciting to listen to. You know, with Stravinsky, you're often on the edge of your seat, wondering where it's going to go. Because there's no downbeat. There's no sort of rhythmic security in the normal way. Equally... I mean, we could lampoon Schoenberg unfairly and say, well, Frere Jacques in a Schoenbergian style. You know, it would sound something like that. I say lampoon because there is actually a very strict organisation at play with the melodic line within Schoenberg and the 12-tone composers. But uh, again, he was setting melody free in that sense. And um, we've got then harmony, rhythm and melody being set free, all sorts of um, forms being ruptured and reinvented as well. The symphony would never quite be the same until perhaps Shostakovich, but he was deliberately looking back. But you know, composers in the early 20th, early 20th century didn't feel the need to fall in line with convention in the same way. Now, another important influence was the modern industrial world and the sounds of motors and engines and that of factories. If you think of Mozilov's Iron Foundry, that is a wonderful evocation of that world. If you bring it to the piano, and I'm gonna do this now with Frere Jacques, why not? You could have something that sounds like an engine in the left hand here. And Bartok, 
and before him Prokofiev enjoyed that kind of rhythmic drive which mixed the sounds of the factory with quite aggressive at times folk dance rhythms as well. So Ferrojack in the style of Prokofiev would sound like this. So there you go, that was Ferrojacker in the style of Prokofiev. So we've now reached the 1920s and I think that, ladies and gentlemen, is a good place at which to leave this rather brief and rapid history of the Western art music. Now let me remind you, we started with medieval monks and we've come all the way now to modern masters. And if you're interested in finding out more, then I will be delving deeper into the treasure trove that is the Romantic era and the um, early modern masters of the 20th century in a separate lecture in about a month's time. So do join me for that one. And in the meantime, happy listening.